Partners, uh, I'm MC Owens, and this is the beginning of the Vimalakirti experience. And this is a two month journey, an eight week uh, journey that we're all about to embark on. And that's gonna be a reading of the Holy Teachings of Vimalakirti. Um, I have, a, obviously I got a few things to say tonight uh, before we get started. Um, but before I do, I wanna introduce what's happening, which is at four, the next eight weeks, every Sunday night, I'm gonna read a chapter from the Vimalakirti Sutra. That's the Sutra we're reading. Um, it's uh, 12 chapters long. So tonight, for example, I'm actually gonna to try to do the first two chapters. Some nights will be one chapter, some nights will be two. And then the fun continues on Thursday nights at 7.30. And that's Michael Taft's uh, Deconstructing Yourself Guided Meditation class. And he's going to be focusing every Thursday night for the next eight weeks on the chapters that I'm doing of the Vimalakirti. And so the idea being that I'm going to do this kind of reading and explanation of the text. And then um, you can do the actual uh, contemplations and um, uh, considerations of the advice from the layman Vimalakirti. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is I actually have planned, um, a lot of reading. I'm going to actually read the first chapter in its entirety. Um, I've done a special, uh, version of this. So if you're following along at home, there are th three generally accepted or noted translations of the Vimalakirti Sutra. Um, the one by Robert Thurman, the one by Burton Watson, and one by Charles Look. Uh, I'm actually translating in my own version from the Chinese, but for tonight, I'm going to be using the structure of the Thurman one, the general layout of that as the framework. So if you're following along and you want to read along, I encourage you to read the Robert Thurman one. But you're going to see a lot of differences. You're going to hear a lot of differences. I've taken some parts of the Chinese and put them in. Um, I've done this particular translation, um, kind of gender neutral. Uh, I'm not going so I'm not meaning gender neutral like that the Buddha and Vimalakirti and all of that are going to be gender neutral. But what I've tried to do is reconstruct this in a way so that. Uh, descriptions of bodhisattvas and the behavior of bodhisattvas is uh, gender neutral uh, in general in the plural so it's just they um, rather than having it repeated he does this he does that he does this he does that which can get a little nauseating uh, at times so note on that um, obviously I need to say a few words about the Malakirti and where we're at um, if you have been coming to the Dharma doors as of late, we've sort of been in this neck of the woods. And what this neck of the woods is here, these are the five Nikayas. These are all English translations of the older Pali suttas, representative of this thing called the Hinayana, the little vehicle. Um, what we're reading tonight is a what is called a Mahayana text, and it is, of course, about the Mahayana, and in particular, the idea of this Bodhisattva path. So we're going to be talking a lot about Bodhisattvas tonight, or in fact, I'm going to be reading a lot about Bodhisattvas tonight. What I want to introduce very quickly is that, again, if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, you know that I have a tendency to teach the Pali, the older Pali suttas, that I have a tendency to teach them allegorically. I have a tendency to read them as stories, as narratives, and, you know, not so much as these oral teachings, these oral preservations of teachings and things like that. Yes, they are probably oral preservations of teachings, but what I've tried to show everybody is that even these very old texts they have a narrative structure, they have an allegorical structure, they can be read and are, are meant to be read at many different levels. There's so much symbolism involved, 
not to mention the poetics. I spent a whole month on the similes and parables and metaphors. So it's, it's already built into the Buddhist tradition to be quite, um, well, fictional in that sense, or at least using stories and things like that, knowingly using stories. So this sort of uh, allegorical approach to sutras becomes, um, in its full fruition, becomes this, which is a three volume. It's, this is just one Mahayana Sutra. This is called the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland uh, Sutra, as it's called. And the reason why I mention this, and also this yellow volume, which is the, the Heap of Jewels, the Ratnakuta Sutra, these two sutras and the Vimalakirti are all in a family of sutras dealing with a concept that for all intents and purposes tonight, we will call the inconceivable and the very idea of inconceivability. So these are all wrapped up in a dialogue or a discourse about a particular idea. Um, they're all Buddhist, of course. All of this is Buddhism, and that's what I'm always trying to make a point of, is that there's a continuity between all of this. So I just want you to be aware of where that's falling in. Um, the Vimalakirti Sutra that we're reading tonight, Sanskrit, which the Robert Thurman ones translated from Sanskrit. It's called the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, which means the advice of Vimalakirti. And in case you're wondering, which I'm sure you are, Vimalakirti, the word Vimala is going to be very important to the whole sutra and in particular to the conversation tonight. Vimala means uh, without stain, without fault, so flawless, stainless. It's a word for pure. Uh, meaning without stain or blemish or fault, flawless, all of that, like a flawless diamond and all of that. And I want us really, oh, and Kirti, by the way, means uh, fame. Kirti, Vimal Kirti is a guy, he's a layman, the layman Vimal Kirti, and he's famous. And there's one way to read Vimal Kirti is that he is famous for being flawless or he's a lay person who's famous for being stainless it's one way to read it there's another way to read it too which is that he has stainless fame stainless notoriety flawless notoriety flawless fame and there's a way to read that to which is that he's a very famous uh, guy a very famous lay person um, but that his fame is not tainted with ego, uh, uh, you know, egocentrism, conceit, and all of that. So that's the who we're dealing with. He's the star of the show, this guy Vimalakirti. That's his house. Uh, we'll get to him in a little bit. But before we get to Vimalakirti, and I do want to introduce him tonight because it would be kind of, it wouldn't be good to have the beginning of the Vimalakirti experience not include Vimalakirti. So, we're going to get to him in, in a bit, but very quickly, I just need to explain this board. Uh, welcome to Buddha land, right? So this is, of course, a Mahayana Sutra. And so we're going to be dealing with this sort of distinction between the so-called small vehicle Hinayana, the Shravaka Yana, the Shravaka path. Shravaka means voice hearer, follower. The, the Arhat path, the Bhikshu path, the monastic path, the Shravaka Hinayana path sort of refers to the old program of Buddhism as found in these. So that's going to be contrasted with the Bodhisattva path and the Mahayana teachings. And in particular, the Bodhisattva path that's based on these 10 paramitas. So I'm going to quickly just talk about these uh, 10 practices of the Bodhisattva path. I'm going to talk about these 10 things. And, and I was, as I was saying right before we cut out, you're going to be hearing these words and these ideas like wisdom, transcendent wisdom, resolve, determination. And as they appear in the sutra tonight, I want you to know that they're speaking about this Bodhisattva path. 
And this path that has these 10 qualities or these 10 practices, this is sort of what makes the Bodhisattva practice or the Bodhisattva path, the Bodhisattva path. That they practice generosity or dana, giving, moral discipline called shila, and traditionally moral discipline or shila refers to precepts, vows, uh, things like moral discipline, thou shalt not do X, Y, and Z, that type of stuff. The third here, kshanti, is patient tolerance. So it's sometimes translated as patience, tolerance. Then there is virya, determination or drive. And then our dhyana, classic Buddhist meditation, meditative absorption, mindfulness, that's all dhyana. Transcendent wisdom or pranya. This is sort of the main focus of the bodhisattva is the development of this sort of transcendent wisdom. Now, these are the, those are the six traditional paramitas that you're probably familiar with, but there are also these four additional ones of skillful means or upaya. And this sutra is all about upaya, this sort of seventh, seventh paramita. Then an interesting one, pranidana, translated as devotion, surrender, um, uh, things like that. It's a very interesting idea, and it has to do with the surrendering of oneself to a kind of higher power or higher force. Number nine is the development of bala or power, usually spiritual power. And then the last highest, fi highest final development of a bodhisattva is jnana, direct knowledge, jnana. All right, so that's, those are the practices of the Bodhisattva. But what we're going to be talking about tonight, this is where, you know, there's so many things that I could talk about with the sutra. It's the kind of sutra that we could read literally like the first paragraph for eight weeks, easily, you know. And so I'm doing a juggling act of what's important, what's not, what do we want to, what do we want to focus on this time around. And so there's two ideas that you need to be hip to in order to, well, in order to actually just hear the sutra. This was one of those sutras that actually, if you just know a couple of things they're talking about, like a, a couple of basic ideas that they are dealing with that might sound weird and confusing, but if you know what they're talking about, the sutra speaks for itself. And so we're going to be talking about this idea of a Buddha Kshetriya. All right, this is kind of a, a new idea. You're not really going to find this idea so much in here. It is in here, though. It is in the old teaching, and I want to just give you the quick genealogy of this idea. So a Buddha Kshetra, what would be translated and what Thurman translates as a Buddha field, all right, a Buddha field. And where this idea is coming from is a very, very old idea. It actually is an idea that predates Buddhism. And it's the idea that a Tathagata, uh, an enlightened being, has a particular sphere, sphere of influence. The idea is, is that their, their aura or their luminance or their radiance or their wisdom or whatever is so powerful that even getting close to them has effects. And there's actual discourses about how broad or wide this sphere of influence is. All right, so I just want you to know that that's what is the the seed or the origin of this idea of a Buddha Kshetra is this field of influence that a Buddha has. All right. Now, what's interesting is that this word Buddha Kshetra gets translated into Chinese as a, a photo, a Buddha land. And this is where the idea of pure lands or Buddha lands come from. So welcome to Buddha land. That's the theme for tonight is welcome to the Buddhaverse. Um, 
this is where t- this sutra tonight is such a beautiful introduction to Mahayana Buddhism, where, where the Buddha is something quite profound. Not just a person, a guru from 2,500 years ago, not just a guru teacher person that we have records of. This Mahayana idea of a Buddha and a Buddha Kshetra, well, what I've drawn on the board here, so this is our Buddha or Tathagata, the thus come one, and in red here is his field like a sports field, and that's his field of influence, okay? And again, the original idea for this was that an enlightened being, like a person who was enlightened, sort of had this sphere of influence. But just so that we can jump right into it, what this Mahayana idea of Buddhism is, and what their idea of a Buddha realm, or a Buddha Kshetra, a Buddha field is, is we're, we're in a Buddha field right now. And the reason why we're in a Buddha field right now is because I keep using this word Buddha and I keep talking about the Dharma and I keep bringing up these ideas and I'm creating a Buddha field. <laughs> so it's this idea that I'm always discussing, which is there's this, this idea of the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body of the Buddha, that is this like kind of transcendent mystical idea that wherever, whenever the Dharma is in the air and where it is being an influence, that's a Buddha field. And you could go so far as to call it a Buddha land. And tonight when I read the sutra, I'm not gonna use Buddha Kshetra and I'm not gonna use Robert Thurman's language of Buddha field. I'm gonna use Buddha land. (laughs) And I want you to know that that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about another planet. I'm not talking about alternate dimensions or universes, I'm talking about realms in which the Dharma is being discussed and has an influence on people's minds, like like this, right? So that's a Buddha field that we're going to be talking about is this kind of more mystical idea of creating or generating a sphere of influence of Dharma. And related to that is this idea of purity. In fact, chapter one of the sutra is called Purifying Buddha Lands, or Robert Thurman, The Purification of Buddha Fields. And so what we're talking about is that in these Buddha realms, in in the Buddhaverse, in this Buddha land, there is a process of purification, a process of enlightenment. The reason why I'm, I, I'm, I want to just stress this idea because, you know, language of, of purity and impurity gets really dangerous really quick. And, and I'm not a huge fan of language of purity and impurity. But this is about Vimala. This is about, it's a very different, I mean, it's a very subtle Dharma way of talking about purity and impurity. And in fact, the whole first chapter is about this subtle idea of purity and impurity. So I'm going to let the sutra talk for itself. I just want you to know that they're not talking about like, you know, the normal pure impure, if if that makes sense. All right. They're kind of talking in a sense, well, about non-duality. And Michael Taft and I, we've called this kind of experience entering the the gate of non-duality or entering the Dharma door of non-duality. And the idea is, is that within this framework, duality, dualism is impure. That's impure. Calling something pure and calling another thing impure, that's impure. That's impurity. So that's a very subtle dharma that I just dropped on you as a little precursor to our sutra. All right. Uh, That should cover it. Questions before I dive into the reading. Again, it speaks for itself. It's a story. It's a bedtime story. 
Everybody good? Okay. Um, uh, I would refer, I would encourage you to refer back to the, the mural as the reading goes on, because we are going to be introduced to this guy, Ratnakara. He's a bodhisattva. He's a lichavi. Vimalakirti is a lichavi. And what that means is that, that they're from Vaishali, which is where the sutra takes place. It's a, it's a region. So when it talks about the lichavi Ratnakara, Lichavi is his uh, nationality, for lack of a better term. And that just brings me to this uh, point that this takes place in Vaishali, yet a new city. And it's where the Malakirti lives. So, uh, great. Um, and again, just so that your, ears, that your ears are pricked up, they're going to be talking about the Bodhisattva and be talking about the Shravaka path. So they're going to be distinguishing the both and then ultimately talking about the Buddha path. So just, again, things to look out for. All right. Um, uh, the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, Chapter 1, Purifying Buddha lands. Thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was in the Amra gardens in the city of Vaishali, accompanied by a great assembly. Of bhikshus, there were 8,000, all arhats. They were free from impurities and afflictions and had all attained self mastery. Their minds were entirely liberated by perfect knowledge. They were calm and dignified, like royal elephants. They had accomplished the work, done what they had to do, cast off their burdens, attained the goal, totally destroying the bonds of existence. They had all attained the utmost perfection of every form of mind control. Of bodhisattvas, there were 32,000 great spiritual heroes who were all universally acclaimed. They were dedicated through the penetrating activity of their great supernormal knowledge and were sustained by the miraculous support of the Buddha. Guardians of the city of the Dharma, their great teachings resounded like a lion's roar throughout the ten directions. Without having to be asked, they were the natural Kalyanamitra, spiritual friends of all living beings. They maintained unbroken the succession of the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, conquering devils and foes and overwhelming all critics. Their mindfulness, intelligence, realization, meditation, recitations, and eloquence all were perfected. They were free of all obstructions and emotional involvements, living in liberation without impediment. They were totally dedicated through the practice of the paramitas, generosity, discipline, tolerance, effort, meditation, transcendent wisdom, skillful means, devotion, power, and knowledge. They had attained the patient tolerance for the non-origination of all phenomena. They turned the irreversible wheel of the Dharma. They were stamped with the insignia of signlessness. They were expert in knowing the spiritual faculties of all living beings. They were brave with confidence that all's all assemblies, having learned to be fearful of nothing. They had gathered the two great stores, the stores of merit and the stores of transcendent wisdom. And their bodies, beautiful without ornaments, were adorned with auspicious signs and marks. They were exalted in fame and glory, like the lofty Mount Maru, their high resolve as hard as diamond, unbreakable in their devotion to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. They showered forth the rain of ambrosia that is released by the light rays of the jewel of the Dharma, which shines everywhere. Their voices were perfect in diction and resonance, and versatile in speaking all languages. They had penetrated the profound principle of dependent origination and had destroyed the persistence of the intellectual mental habits underlying all convictions concerning the finitude, 
or infinitude of all phenomena. They spoke fearlessly like, like lions, sounding the thunder of the magnificent dharma. Unequaled, they surpassed all measure. They were the best captains for the voyage of discovery of the treasures of the dharma, the stores of merit and transcendent wisdom. They were experts in the way of the dharma, which is straight, peaceful, subtle, gentle, hard to see, and difficult to realize. They were endowed with the wisdom that is, un, that is able to understand the thoughts of all living beings, as well as their comings and goings. They had been consecrated with the anointment of the peerless, transcendent wisdom of all Buddhas. With their high resolve, they approached the ten powers, the four fearlessnesses, and the eighteen special qualities of the Buddha. They had crossed the terrifying abyss of the bad rebirths, and yet they assumed reincarnation voluntarily in all rebirths for the sake of all living beings. Great kings of medicine, understanding origin of all illnesses, they knew how to apply the medicine of the Dharma appropriately. They were in inexhaustible minds of limitless virtues, and they glorified innumerable Buddha lands with the splendor of these virtues. They conferred great benefit when seen, heard, or even neared. Were one to extol them for innumerable hundreds of thousands of myriads of kalpas, one still could not exhaust their mighty flood of virtues. The names of these great bodhisattvas were Samadarshana, Asamadarshana, Samadhi Vikravitivaraja, Dharmeshvara, Dharmaketu, Prabhaketu, Prabhavyuha, Mahavyuha, Pratibhanakutta, Ratnakutta, Ratnapani, Ratnamujahasta, Nitya Pralambahasta, Nityotkipshtahasta, Nityatapta, Nitya Mudityandriya, Pramodya Raja, Deva Raja, Pranidana Prayesha Prapta, Prasitha Prati Samvit Prapta, Gaganaganga, Ratnaloka Parigrita, Ratnasura, Ratnapriya, Ratnashri, Indrajala, Jalini Prabha, Niralamda Dhyana, Pranyakuta, Ratnadatta, Mara Pramardaka, Vidyudeva, Vikar Vanraja, Ketu Nimita Samati Granta, Simhana Dandin, Giryagra Pramradi Raja, Ganda Hastin, Ganda Kunjara Naga, Nityo Dukta, Anik Shipta Dura, Pramati Sujata, Padma Shri Garba, Padma Vyuha, Avilokiteshvara, Mahastama Prapta, Brahma Jala, Ratna Dandin, Mara Karma Vijeta, Kshetra Samalamkara, Mani Ratna Chaitra, Suvarna Kuda, Mani Kuda, Maitreya, and Manjushri Kumara Buddha, the Dharma Prince Bodhisattva of Transcendent Wisdom, and so on. With the remainder being 32,000 Bodhisattvas. There were also gathered there 10,000 Brahma gods, with Brahma god Sikkin at their head who came from the Ashoka world system with its four continents to see, venerate, and serve the Buddha, and to hear the Dharma from his own mouth. There were 12,000 chakra gods from various four continent world systems, and there were other powerful gods as well. Brahma, Chakras, Lokapalas, Devas, Nagas, Yakshas, Gandharavas, Asuras, Garudas, Kimnaras, and Maharagas. Finally, there was the fourfold community of bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasaka, and upasika, the monks, the nuns, the laymen, and the laywomen. At that time, the Buddha, surrounded and venerated by this great multitude of many hundreds of thousands of living beings, sat upon a majestic lion throne and began to teach the Dharma. Just as Sumaru, the king of mountains, looms high over the oceans, the Buddha shone, radiated, and glittered as he sat upon his magnificent lion throne, dominating the multitudes. Thereupon, 
a lichavi, a bodhisattva, Ratnakara, along with 500 other lichavi youths, each holding a precious parasol made of the seven treasures, gold, silver, agate, pearl, lapis lazuli, ruby, and emerald. They came forth from the city of Vaishali and presented the Buddha at the grove of the Amra Gardens. Each approached the Buddha, bowed at his feet, circumambulated him with his right shoulder to him seven times, and laid down his precious parasol in offering and withdrew to one side. As soon as all 500 of these precious parasols had been laid down, suddenly, by the miraculous power of the Buddha, they were transformed into a single precious canopy, so great that it formed a covering for this entire 3,000-fold world system. And the surface of the entire 3,000-fold world system was reflected in the interior surface of this single great precious canopy, where the total content of this threefold thousand world system could be seen. Limitless circuits of the suns, moons, and stars, the realms of the devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, asuras, garudas, kimnaras, and maharagas, as well as the realms of the four maharajas, the king of mountains, Mount Sumeru, snow mountains, Muchilinda mountains, Maha Muchilinda mountains, fragrant mountains, jeweled mountains, gold mountains, black mountains, iron and circling mountains, all the great oceans, rivers, bays, torrent streams, brooks and springs. Finally, all the villages, suburbs, cities, capitals, provinces, and all wildernesses. All this could be clearly seen by everyone, reflected in the interior surface of this single great precious canopy. And all the voices of all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions could be heard, proclaiming their teachings of the Dharma in all worlds, the sounds reverberating in the space beneath this great, precious canopy. At this vision of the magnificent miracle affected by the supernatural power of the Buddha, the entire assembly was ecstatic, enraptured, astonished, delighted, satisfied, and filled with awe and pleasure. They all bowed down to the Tathagata, withdrew to one side with their palms pressed together, and gazed upon him with fixed attention. The young Lichavi, Ratnakara, knelt with his right knee on the ground, raised his palms pressed together in salute of the Buddha, and praised him with the following hymn. Pure are your eyes, broad and beautiful like the petals of a blue lotus. Pure is your thought, having discovered the supreme transcendence of all meditations. Immeasurable is the ocean of your virtues, the accumulation of all your good deeds. You affirm the path of peace, O great ascetic. I bow to you. Leader, bull of men, we behold the revelation of your miracle. The superb and radiant fields of the Sugatas appear before us, and your extensive spiritual teachings that lead to the deathless state make themselves heard throughout the whole reach of space. Dharma King, you rule by way of the Dharma, your supreme Dharma kingdom, and thereby bestow the treasures of the Dharma upon all living beings. Expert in calming and contemplation, you teach the ultimate meaning. Sovereign, Lord of the Dharma, I bow to you. All phenomena arise dependently from causes and conditions, yet they are neither existent nor non-existent. Therein is neither a self nor experiencer nor a doer, yet actions good or evil maintain their effects. Such is your teaching. O Shakyamuni, Conquering the powerful hosts of Mara, you found peace, the deathless state, 
and the joy of the supreme unsurpassable enlightenment, which is not realized by those holding other views. Though they too arrest sensations, thought, and mental processes. O wonderful king of the Dharma, you turn the wheel of the Dharma before men and gods with its threefold turnings, its manyfold aspects, its purity of nature, the extreme peace, and thereby the three jewels were revealed. Those who are well disciplined by this precious Dharma are free from vain imaginings and are always deeply peaceful. Supreme Doctor, you put an end to birth, aging, sickness, and death. Immeasurable ocean of virtue, I bow to you. Like Mount Sumeru, you are unmoved by honor or scorn. You love moral and immoral beings equally. Poised in equanimity, your mind is like the sky. Who would not honor such a precious jewel of a being? The entire 3,000-fold world system with its realms of gods and nagas and men appears in my tiny parasol offered to the world-honored one. Thus we bow to your vision, knowledge, and mass of virtues. The Buddha displays these miraculous worlds to us with this miracle like a play of lights. We bear witness in astonishment. Obeisance to the world honored one, Lord of ten powers, endowed with knowledge and vision. Great sage, in all these multitudes gathered here and afar, we look upon your countenance with hearts of sincere faith, and all beings behold the victor as if there, standing right before them. This is a special quality of the Buddha. Although the world honor one speaks with but, but, with but one voice, those present perceive the same voice differently and each understand it in their own language according to their own needs. This is a special quality of the Buddha. From the leader's act of speaking in a single voice, some merely developed an instinct for the Dharma, some gain realization, while some find pacification of their uncertainty. This is a special quality of the Buddha. I bow to you who command the force of great leadership and the ten powers. I bow to you who are dauntless, the fearless. I bow to you, leader of all living beings, who fully manifests all the special qualities of a Buddha. I bow to you who have cut the bondage of the fetters. I bow to you who, having gone beyond, now stand on firm ground. I bow to you who save suffering beings. I bow to you who does not remain in migrations of birth and death. You associate with living beings by frequenting their migrations, yet your mind is liberated from all migration. Just as the lotus flower born of the mud is not tainted by it, so the lotus of the Buddha is realized in emptiness. You nullify all signs, characteristics, and marks in all things everywhere. You are not subject to any wish for anything at all. The miraculous power of the Buddha is inconceivable. I bow to you, who stand nowhere like infinite space. Then the young Lichavi Ratnakara, having celebrated the Buddha with these verses, further addressed him saying, World Honored One, these 500 young Lichavis are truly on their way to supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. And they have asked, How do Bodhisattvas purify Buddha lands? Please, World Honored One, explain to them how Bodhisattvas purify Buddha lands. Upon this request, the Buddha gave his approval to the young Lichavi Ratnakara. Good, good young man. Your question to the Tathagata about the purification of Buddha lands is indeed a good one. Therefore, young man, listen well and remember, I will explain to you the purification of Buddha lands by Bodhisattvas. Very good, world honored one, replied Ratnakara and the 500 young Lichavis, and they set themselves to listen. The Buddha said, Noble sons and daughters, 
a Buddha land of bodhisattvas is a field of living beings. How so? Bodhisattvas embrace a Buddha land to the same extent that they cause the development of living beings. They embrace a Buddha land to the same extent that living beings become established in discipline. They embrace a Buddha land to the same extent through entrance into such Buddha lands, living beings are introduced to Buddha knowledge. They embrace a Buddha land to the same extent that through entrance into such Buddha lands, living beings increase their spiritual faculties. And how is this noble son? A Bodhisattva's Buddha land springs from the aims of living beings. For example, Ratnakara. Should someone wish to build something out of empty space, one might go ahead, in spite of the fact that it is not possible to build or to adorn anything in empty space. In just the same way, should bodhisattvas knowing full well that all phenomena are like empty space. If they should wish to build a Buddha land in order to develop living beings, they may go ahead in spite of the fact that it is not possible to build or adorn a Buddha land in empty space. You see, Ratnakara, a Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of positive thought. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings free of hypocrisy and deceit are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of high resolve. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who have harvested the two stores of merit and wisdom and have planted roots of virtue are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of virtuous application. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who live by all virtuous principles are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is the magnificence of the conception of the spirit of enlightenment. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who are actually practicing the Mahayana, the great way, are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of generosity. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who give away all possession are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of discipline. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who follow the path of 10 virtues with positive thoughts are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's <clears throat> Buddha land is a field of patient tolerance. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings practiced in patient tolerance Discipline and the four immeasurables are adorned with the 32 auspicious marks and are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of determination and effort. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who devote their efforts to virtue are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of dhyana meditation. When enlightenment is attained this way, Living beings who are evenly balanced through calming and contemplation are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is a field of transcendent wisdom. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who are destined for the ultimate are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land consists of the four immeasurables. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who live by loving kindness compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land consists of the four means of unification. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who are held together by all liberations are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is upaya, skillful means. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings skilled in all liberative techniques and activities are born in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land consists of the 37 aids to enlightenment. When enlightenment is attained this way, living beings who devo devote their efforts to the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four bases of supernormal power, the five spiritual faculties, the five strengths, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the eightfold noble path 
are born in this Buddha, Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is the mind of total dedication. When enlightenment is attained this way, ornaments of all virtues appear in that Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is the doctrine that eradicates the eight adversities. When enlightenment is attained this way, the three lower migrations will cease and there will be no such thing as the eight adversities in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land consists of personal observance of the basic precepts and restraint in blaming others for their transgression of the precepts. When enlightenment is attained this way, even the word crime will never be mentioned in this Buddha land. A Bodhisattva's Buddha land is the purity of the path of the ten virtues. When enlightenment is attained this way, Living beings who are secure in long life, great in wealth, proper in conduct, enhanced by true speech, soft-spoken, free of divisive intrigue, and adept at reconciling factions, enlightening in their conversations, free of envy, free of malice, and endowed with perfect view, are all born in this Buddha land. Thus, noble son, just as is the Bodhisattva's production of the spirit of enlightenment, so is their positive thought. And just as is their positive thought, so is their virtuous application. Their virtuous application is tantamount to their high resolve. Their high resolve tantamount to their determination. Their determination is tantamount to their practice. Their practice tantamount to their total dedication. Their total dedication is tantamount to their skillful means. Their skillful means is tantamount to their development of all living beings. And their development of all living beings is tantamount to the purity of their Buddha land. The purity of a Buddha land reflects the purity of all living beings. The purity of living beings reflects the purity of a Bodhisattva's knowledge. The purity of a Bodhisattva's knowledge reflects the purity of their Dharma. The purity of their Dharma reflects the purity of their practice of the Paramitas. And the purity of a Bodhisattva's practice of the Paramitas is a reflection of their own mind. Thereupon, magically influenced by the Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra had this thought. If, the Buddha, if a Buddha land is pure only to the extent that the mind of the Bodhisattva is pure, then when Shakyamuni Buddha was engaged in the path of a Bodhisattva, his mind must have been impure. Otherwise, how could this Buddha land appear so impure? The Buddha, knowing telepathically the thought of the Venerable Shariputra, said to him, Hey, Shariputra, what do you think? Is it because the sun and the moon are impure that those blind from birth do not see them? Shariputra replied, No, world honor one. It is not so. The fault is with those blind from birth, not with the sun and the moon. The Buddha declared, In the same way, Shariputra, the fact that some living beings do not behold the splendid display of virtues of this Buddha land, of the Tathagata, is due to their own ignorance. It is not the fault of the Tathagata. Shariputra, the Buddha land of the Tathagata is pure, but you don't see it. Then the Brahma god, Shikin, said to the venerable Shariputra, Venerable, do not say that this Buddha land of the Tathagata is impure. Venerable, this Buddha land of the Tathagata is pure. I see the splendid expanse of this Buddha land of the world honored one, Shakyamuni, as equal to the splendor of the abodes of the highest deities. Then the venerable Shariputra said to the Brahma god Shikin, as for me, O Brahma, I see this great earth with its highs and lows, its thorns, its precipices, its peaks, 
and its abysses as if it were entirely filled with suffering. Brahma Shikin replied, The fact that you see such a Buddha land as this, as if it were so impure, Venerable Shariputra, is a sure sign that there are highs and lows in your mind and that your positive thought in regard to Buddha knowledge is not pure either. Venerable Shariputra, those whose minds are truly impartial toward all living beings and whose positive thought toward Buddha knowledge is pure, see this Buddha land also as perfectly pure. Thereupon, the world honored one touched the ground of this 3,000 fold world system with his big toe. And suddenly it was transformed into a huge mass of precious jewels, a magnificent arrangement of many hundreds of thousands of millions of clusters of precious gems until it resembled the world system of the Buddha Ratna Vyuha. Everyone in the entire assembly was filled with wonder, perceiving themselves seated on magnificent thrones of jeweled lotuses. Then the Buddha said to the Venerable Shariputra, This Buddha land is always pure, but the Tathagata makes it appear to be stained by many faults in order to bring about the maturity of living beings. For example, Shariputra, the gods of the 33 heavens all take their food from a single precious vessel, yet the nectar which nourishes each one differs according to the differences in the merit each god has accumulated. Just so, Shariputra, living beings born in the same Buddha land see the splendor of the virtues of the Buddha lands of the Buddhas according to their own degrees of purity. When the splendor of the beauty of the virtues of the Buddha land shone forth, 84,000 beings conceived the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment, and the 500 Lichavi youths who had accompanied the young Lichavi Ratnakara all attained the patient tolerance for the non-origination of all phenomena. Then the world honored one, Lifting his big toe withdrew his miraculous power, and at once the Buddha land was restored to its usual appearance. Both men and gods who subscribed to the path of the voice hearer thought, Alas, all constructed things are impermanent. Thereby, 32,000 living beings purified their immaculate undistorted dharma eye in regard to all phenomena. 8,000 monastics were liberated from their mental defilements, attaining a state of complete non-grasping. And the 84,000 living beings who were devoted to the grandeur of this Buddha land, having understood that all things are by nature but magical creations, all conceived in their own minds the spirit of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. Yay! <laughs> uh. Chapter one. Questions, comments, answers, idea. Hey, Michael. Hi. So there are so many things to say, but uh, one thing that uh, it touched me like at the personal level of realization with this uh, sutra, with this first uh, chapter, is the topic around the upaya, right? And while I was contemplating your upaya, your skillful mean, and in particularly in the part where you were reading the names of all these arhats and bodhisattvas. <laughs> and I was trying, connecting trying. with the name of all of them in a way that uh, reminded me a lot of my uh, Vajrayana practice when I follow a sadhana that contains or that introduces me to the concept of a lineage tree. And 
a, a lineage of transmission where uh, me as a practitioner, um, a link to it through my teachers and through their teachers. And these sadhanas, they often start with a chance to the first uh, lineage holder of the tradition all the way back or down to yourself. You, in some sadhanas, you end up uh, singing the name of your own teacher as the last uh, link in that, change, in that chain of transmission. So uh, that's a wonderful upaya that I'm now realizing, the power of invoking names. Mm. So thank you so much. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's a, lot, there's a lot I could say about those names. And of course, the, the Chinese translation, he translates those names, their meaning. They're, they don't actually all line up exactly right. So you kind of need a little Sanskrit knowledge. Um, but if you wanted to know what they mean, but yeah. I'm a, I'm, I started studying Sanskrit. So oh. I'm, I'm going to, and I actually just realizing that I also make a lot of connections when I read and memorize the name of Indian teachers with these fantastic names. So it's something that I'll look at it more. Nice. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Eric. Any other I, questions, ideas? I had a question. Yeah, Tanya. So I noticed there was something mentioned a few times, the 3,000-fold world system. What is that? Uh, so, yep. Um, so the, the basic idea is, you know, if you watched or were there for my cosmology talk. I saw it online. Yep. So that's okay. the idea of a world system okay and basically um you see it a little bit in the older teachings but the mahayana talks a lot about actually a group of a thousand of those world and then a group of a thousand of those of a thousand world systems and then a thousand groups of those thousand groups of thousand world systems, which in total is a billion world systems. And that is a 3000 fold world system. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yep. I didn't make that connection with the, with the presentation you've done before. Thanks. So yeah, not only in the canopy, you know, this beautiful image where they put their umbrellas, their little parasols down and he turns them all into one giant parasol. And what's being reflected on the underside of it is not just everything in this world, it's everything in that billion, all billion worlds. So it was all the mountains in all billion worlds, all the, you know, on and on and on and on. Thanks. Yeah. There, was a, there was a lot in that chapter one. <laughs> like, I really want to go back and read it. So here's the thing. Um, this is particularly true of Mahayana Sutras, and I often teach Mahayana Sutras this way. The first chapter is the whole sutra in one chapter. Ah, uh, so this is, they're, they're kind of setting it up, right? Is it kind yep. of like they're setting it up? Okay. So every single idea, signlessness, wishlessness, emptiness, uh, the 10 superpowers, everything is going to get explained. Okay. And, and it's why I was like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm just <laughs> going to read it because it is to pique your interest. You are supposed to be a little, uh, you know, a, a little, a little jealous of these bodhisattvas. You know, you're <laughs> supposed to be a little like, how do I do that? And the sutra is about that. So, okay. um, and I would encourage anybody to really consider that idea that the whole Vimalakirti Sutra just happened. <laughs> In, in okay. that, the first chapter is this, the whole thing in one chapter. So. All right. Yeah. Hi, Michael. So that's what we're here to do. Hi, Michael. It's Hi. Novi. Oh. Hi, it's Novi. No. Uh, yeah. Boy, this last, uh, you know, uh, fourth paragraph, you know, where, where we, uh, it, I make it seem impure land full of de uh, defilements. That is all. I make like uh, the heavenly beings, they eat different foods uh, depending on their merit and virtues. 
that each possesses. Yep. It is that the same case, Sarabhuti, if a person's mind, mind is pure, then he will see the wonderful blessings that adorn this land. And the idea of looking out into the world that we, you and I had talked about has become very clear through that one sentence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, the overall message of this chapter and the whole sutra for that matter is this idea. And again, it's important to keep in mind like old school Buddhism, where they kind of said like everything in the world is suffering, source of suffering, kind of impure, temp temptuous and all of that. This is sort of a different message in that way, where as I often teach it, you know, the idea is that nothing out in that world is pure or impure. The, it's the mind that's running around deeming things as pure and impure. <laughs> like that's the impure problem. So this is truly Mahayana Buddhism where it's, it's d getting directly to the problem. And we're, we're done talking about, um, you know, the problem with wealth, the problem with my genitalia and sexuality. Like that's, that's not, the problem <laughs> we're we're gonna focus really on the problem yeah hey michael it's noam hi noam hi um i really appreciate that you before the sutra you talked about those you defined a few things and you talked about what a pure what a Buddha field is and, and what purity means. So purity meaning non-duality, if I understood you correctly, and, and a Buddha field being like what we're doing here, being an example of a Buddha field. And I kept thinking about that during the sutra. And it, it uh, there was a part sort of three quarters of the way through where you're sort of reciting, if a Bodhisattva does such and such, then beings will be purified. I don't remember the exact word, but it was sort of like the, the creation of these Buddha fields was a sort of condition within which people could be, could, could, you know, obtain all these qualities. But it wasn't entirely clear to me if, if it was that the, the Buddha field was the condition for the qualities or the people having those <laughs> qualities created a Buddha field. <clears throat> Does, does that does question, question make sense? <laughs> it makes perfect sense, Noam. And I got to tell you, that section of the sutra, where it's this uh, language of, let me find one. It's this language that a bodhisattva's Buddha land uh, consists of uh, a mind of total dedication. Let's just take that one, right? Mm -hmm. When enlightenment is attained this way, ornaments of all virtues appear in that Buddha land. There is a, a, a formula for each, for the, um, not a formula, but a structure to this, the way this is written. And it is, you know, arguably some of the hardest Buddhist stuff to translate. Mm. And the reason why I say that is, is like, as I've often talked about in other uh, uh, Dharma talks, you know, for a lot of Buddhists, these Buddha lands are other places. They're other realms, they're other dimensions inhabited by beings. And, and I don't ever want to like uh, do a disservice to that whole giant tradition that believes in that. Right now. So the language of um, that when an, yeah, it's just that the structure of that whole section is really tricky to translate. It's, it's like you have to make these really hard decisions in translating in terms of who, who, who's being reborn in these Buddha lands and you know, all of this stuff. And so my, my attempt in tonight's Dharma talk was just to, like, in a way, kind of free us of the grammar. I wanted to, like, not worry so much about the grammar of it. And that there's these things going on, which is that there's bodhisattvas, me and you and everybody involved in this path. We're practicing these things. And by practicing those things, we're sort of purifying 
the our minds, the realms in which we move. And there's then this idea that then through that practice, you can be reborn in this Buddha land of generosity by practicing generosity. Or as a bodhisattva, have I created a Buddha land of generosity that other people, as you're saying, no, get to get born into? Mm -hmm. And then are we talking about like reborn into or mm -hmm. are we talking about coming over for tea? <laughs> right? I don't entirely, and again, I just wanted to okay. put it all out there as okay. ideas of, of okay. maturation, cultivation, and development without uh, settling on one, you know, okay. interpretation. Well, I don't, I don't want to hog airspace, but just related to the, the idea that, uh, that the, the, the idea that, that it, there, there, it's not, it's our minds that have to change. It's not what's in front of us or what's around us. To me, the coming over for tea makes a lot of sense in that, in that sense that it's just, you know, come on over and read this, this sutra, come on over and change your mind. And, you know, you can be in the Buddha land. <clears throat> yep. On this, on this note, I'll, oft, I'll also say that, you know, as, as much, um, as much dialogue and, discourse and doctrine came out of the biblical passage that the kingdom of God is at hand mm -hmm. or in all of the language about the kingdom of God. It, the same thing is going for Buddha lands here. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about heaven, Jesus, mm -hmm. or are we talking about transforming this world? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about, you know, so all of the same discourse is applied again with, with not settling on any interpretation in that, in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Noam. Great question. Other ideas, questions, or comments? Everybody want to meet Vimalakirti? Cool. All right. Um, so for this, I'm actually, because uh, not much changes, I am going to read directly from Thurman. I, of course, I always, anybody who's been uh, Come in here knows I change it all. I change everything all the time. So, <clears throat> but the general gist of it's going to be from here. Um, uh, yeah, there was one other thing, but I think it'll lead us astray. So this is a very short chapter. Again, I think most of the ideas will be pretty self-explanatory. Oh, that's what it was. The what's going on? So if you were here last week for the Anathapindika Sutta, I just wanted to point this out before we read this. This sutra is called, again in Sanskrit, the Vimalakirti Nadesha Sutra, which is the advice of the layman, Vimalakirti. I want to remind you that the Anathapindika Sutra was advice to Anathapindika from this guy, actually, from Shariputra. So again, allegorically, what's happening in a Mahayana way is that in the old school, the monk went to tell the lay person some advice. In this new school, no, no, no. The layman is going to give advice to the bodhisattvas and the same Shariputra. So keep that in mind as you listen to this, right? Okay. Chapter two, Upaya, skillful means. At that time, there lived in the great city of Vaishali, a certainly Chavi, Vimalakirti by name. Having served the ancient Buddhas, he had generated the roots of virtue by honoring them and making offerings to them. He had attained tolerance as well as eloquence. He played with the great superknowledges. He had attained the power of recitations and fearlessness. He had conquered all demons and opponents. He had penetrated the profound way of the Dharma. He was liberated through the transcendence of Pranya wisdom. Having integrated his realization with Upaya, skillful means, he was expert in knowing the thoughts and actions of all living beings. 
knowing the strength or weakness of their faculties and being gifted with unrivaled eloquence, he taught the Dharma appropriately to each. Having applied himself energetically to the great way, the Mahayana, he understood it and accomplished his task with great finesse. He lived with the deportment of a Buddha, and his superior intelligence was as wide as an ocean. He was praised, honored, and commended by all the Buddhas, and was respected by Indra, Brahma, and all the Lokapalas. In order to develop living beings with his upaya, he lived in the great city of Vaishali. His wealth was inexhaustible for the purpose of sustaining the poor and the helpless. He observed a pure morality in order to protect the immoral. He maintained tolerance and self-control in order to reconcile beings who were angry, cruel, violent, and brutal. He blazed with energy in order to inspire people who were lazy. He maintained concentration, mindfulness, and dhyana meditation in order to sustain the mentally troubled. He attained decisive wisdom in order to sustain the foolish. He wore the white robes of a layman, yet lived impeccably like a religious devotee. He lived at home, but remained aloof from the realm of desire, the realm of form, and the formless realm. He had a son, a wife, and attendants, yet always maintained continence. He appeared to be surrounded by servants, yet lived in total solitude. He appeared to be adorned with ornaments, yet always was endowed with auspicious signs and marks. He seemed to eat and drink, yet always took nourishment from the taste of meditation. He made his appearance at the fields of sports and in the casinos, but his aim was always to mature those who were attached to games and gambling. He visited the fashionable academies, yet always kept unswerving loyalty to the Buddha. He understood the mundane and transcendental sciences and esoteric practices, yet always took pleasure in the delights of the Dharma. He mixed in all crowds, yet was respected as foremost of all. In order to be in harmony with people, he associated with elders, with those of middle age, and with the young. He always spoke in harmony with the Dharma. He engaged in all sorts of businesses, yet had no interest in profit or possession. To train living beings, he would appear at crossroads and at street corners, and to protect them, he participated in government. To turn people away from the Hinayana, the little vehicle, and to engage them in the great vehicle, the Mahayana, he appeared among listeners and teachers of the Dharma. He taught children, visiting all the schools. To demonstrate the evils of desire, he even entered brothels. To establish drunkards in correct mindfulness, he entered all the cabarets. He was honored as the businessman among businessmen because he demonstrated the priority of the Dharma. He was honored as the landlord among landlords because he renounced the aggressiveness of ownership. He was honored as the warrior among warriors because he cultivated endurance, determination, and great fortitude. He was honored as the aristocrat among aristocrats because he suppressed pride, vanity, and arrogance. He was honored as the official among officials because he regulated the functions of government according to the Dharma. He was honored as the prince of princes because he reversed their attachment to royal pleasures and sovereign power. He was compatible with ordinary people because he appreciated the excellence of ordinary merits. He was honored as the Indra among Indras because he showed them the temporality of their lordship. He was honored as the Brahma God among Brahma gods because he showed them the special excellence of direct knowledge. He was honored as a Lokapala among Lokapalas because he fostered the development of all living beings. Thus lived the Lichavivi Malakirti in the great city of Vaishali, endowed with an infinite knowledge of upaya and liberative techniques. At that time, 
out of this very upaya, this very skill and means, Vimalakirti manifested himself as if he were sick. To inquire after his health, the king, the officials, the lords, the youths, the aristocrats, the householders, the businessmen, the town folk, the country folk, and thousands of other living beings came forth from the great city of Vaishali and called upon the invalid. When they arrived, Vimalakirti taught them the Dharma, beginning his discourse from the actuality of the four great elements. Friends, this body is so impermanent, fragile, unworthy of confidence, and feeble. It is so insubstantial, perishable, short-lived, painful, filled with diseases, and subject to change. Thus, my friends, as this body is only a vessel of many sicknesses, the wise do not rely on it. This body is like a ball of foam, unable to bear any pressure. It is like a water bubble, not remaining very long. It is like a mirage, born from the appetites of the passions. It is like the trunk of a plantain tree, having no core. <clears throat> Alas, this body is like a machine, a nexus of bones and tendons. It is like a magical illusion consisting of falsifications. It's like a dream being an unreal vision. It's like a reflection, being only an image of our former actions. It is like an echo, being dependent on conditioning. It is like a cloud, being characterized by turbulence and dissolution. It's like a flash of lightning, being unstable, a decaying and decaying every moment. The body is ownerless being the product of a variety of causes and conditions. This body is inert, like the earth, selfless, like water, lifeless, like fire, impersonal, like the wind, and non-substantial, like empty space. This body is unreal, being a collocation of the four great elements. It is void, not existing as self or as self-possessed. It is inanimate, being like grass, trees, walls, clods of earth, and hallucinations. It is insensate, being driven like a windmill. It is filthy, being an agglomeration of pus and excrement. It is false, being fated to be broken and destroyed. In, in spite of being anointed and massaged. It is afflicted by the 404 diseases. It is like an ancient well, constantly overwhelmed by old age. Its duration, never certain. Certain only is its end in death. This body is a combination of five aggregates, 18 elements, and 12 sense media, which are comparable to murderers, poisonous snakes, and a ghost town. Therefore, you should be revulsed by such a body. You should despair of it, and you should arouse your admiration for the body of the Tathagata. Friends, the body of a Tathagata is the body of the Dharma, born of knowledge. The body of a Tathagata is born of the great stores of merit and wisdom. It is born of discipline, meditation, transcendent wisdom, and the liberations, and of the knowledge and vision of liberation. It is born of love, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. It is born of generosity, discipline, self-control. It is born of the path of 10 virtues. It is born of patience and gentleness. 
It is born of the roots of virtue planted by solid effort. It is born of the concentrations of samadhi, the liberations, the dhyana meditations, and the absorptions. It is born of learning, of wisdom, of upaya. It is born of the 37 aids to enlightenment. It is born of calming and contemplation. It is born of the 10 powers, the four fearlessnesses, and the 18 special qualities of a Buddha. It is born of all the paramitas. It is born from sciences and superknowledges. It is born of the abandonment of all evil qualities and of the collection of all good qualities. It is born of truth. It is born of reality. It is born of conscious awareness. Friends, the body of a Tathagata is born of innumerable good works. Towards such a body, you should turn your aspirations. And in order to eliminate the sickness of the passions of all living beings, you should conceive the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. And while the Lichavivi Malakirti thus taught the Dharma to those who had come to acquire about his sickness, many hundreds of thousands of living beings conceived the spirit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. <laughs> hey. Hey. We did it. Chapter one and two. <clears throat> Questions, answers, comments, epiphanies, squeals of delight. <laughs> Squeal. Yay. It's great. I have a weird question. I don't know. When they talk about auspicious signs in Marx, yep. what, what, what is that? Great question. So, Another idea predates Buddhism. You know, this is an old Indian idea. And again, a lot of interpretations. But there is, are traditionally these 32 auspicious lakshana, qualities or characteristics, that, well, let me put it to you this way. So there's these 32 uh bodily marks for example uh the little top knot called an ushnisha not a not a hair bun but an actual protrudence of the skull mm -hmm. called an ushnisha is one of the 32 characteristics all right okay. uh they say and oh and these qualities are characteristics of a buddha or a tathagata but again it's an idea that goes even before Buddhism, the idea that you reach a certain stage of enlightenment and, well, you started to display these auspicious signs. Now, I've talked about these in the past, and the idea is, is that, like, they talk about how, like, a, a Tathagata or a, or a Buddha, that, like, they have, like, ankles like deer and a chest like a lion. And they have like all these kind of weird things. And if you were really to create a caricature image of this being, which I have seen, it, it starts to look a little pretty alien, big protrudence, <laughs> like all kinds of weird stuff going on. And, you know, I've heard that, yeah, people start like growing protrudences and things like that. I've heard that. I've also heard that it's not so much it's not so much that like the enlightened person starts to have a protrudence it's that to people seeing hmm. that person it looks like they have a protrudence if you see the subtle difference there yeah, yeah. I want to add this though um for example, the one that says that a Buddha or Tathagata, one of the 32 marks is they have a chest like a lion. Now, yeah, there's one way to read that, which is 
you know, I don't know, hairy mane type of a thing. <laughs> but when you really start looking at these qualities, it could be that that is sort of a very poetic way of speaking of their pride, of speaking of their, they, he has a chest like a lion and he's so agile. It's like he has, de he has ankles like a deer and he's so beautiful or blah, 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 blah. Like there's ways of reading these not as uh, signs of form that you would see with your eyes, but signs that you might see with like your third eye in a way. So they're a little more poetic. And I think it's helpful to think of them that way because that's what they're talking about. That these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, or these Bodhisattvas, that you reach a certain level of attainment and you display these 32 auspicious marks. Again, one, one way or the other, you know? So. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, they, they, and those get referenced a lot. So, any other questions, comments, or ideas? I, I, I hope everybody saw the Anathapindika connection, um, you know, and not just in the whole he's sick advice thing, but it's actually the same Dharma talk, right? That that Shariputra gave to Anathapindika, where Anathapindika was like, I'm getting sick, this sucks, I, I'm gonna die. And then Shariputra's like, well, yeah, that body might, but you could be liberated right now if you have no attachment to that body that's dying. That's, it's the same Dharma message. It's really the same teaching, but this one is underneath a rainbow canopy of jewels, all of that, right? So I want to point out that, and if there's no comments on that, I have a second very important seed to plant. So this Anathapindika, uh, the Anathapindika code, right? This, this Anathapindika connection. I want to remind us all of the story of Anathapindika that until the Buddha met him, until, Anath until the Buddha met Anathapindika, the, the monks and nuns were, were wandering and sleeping out in the open. Anathapindika buys the Jetavana, he buys the mango grove from, from Prince Jetta, and they build structures on it so that the, the monks can seek shelter, can seek safety, and eventually build a vihara. So, uh, and Anathapindika becomes like the houser of the Sangha. So there is this really deep connection going on between Anathapindika and shelter. So surprise, surprise, when we have this Mahayana Anathapindika Sutra called the Vimalakirti Sutra, and this, this canopy that we are all safely under now, it's sort of talking about shelter. And something that I've said or something that I've been talking about recently, if you wanna really think about, this is my, could be my last comment for tonight. If you wanna really think about a distinction between like old school Buddhism, the monastic path and this new school uh, bodhisattva path. One way to think of it, and, and a lot of what tonight's sutra will maybe even make more sense, the old path was like, this world's crazy. It's crazy. It's like, you know, there's, you know, it's crazy. And so we're going to create this, call it a vihara, call it a monastery, call it a sangha, but we're going to create this safety uh, shelter, call it a refuge, call it taking refuge. We're going to create this shelter from the world. And you can come here and seek shelter in our monastery, in our vihara, in our sangha. The world stays crazy, but we have created a safe space. My uh, 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 the seed I want to plant is a way to think about this whole new kind of Buddhism 
is that the project is to turn the world into a monastery. And I don't mean turn everybody into celibate monks. I mean, turn the world into a safe place. And, and if you think of it that way, like, oh, that's the project. Like, you know, because the old project was good for the monastery, not so good for the world. In, in a sense of that the world was still crazy and this is a refuge from it. This Bodhisattva project is, is wild because they're trying to purify the Buddha land. They're trying to turn the whole thing into a safe refuge for all living beings. So that might be in a, that might be a way to read this magical canopy and the Buddha turning each individual's little canopy into a canopy for all, right? There are so many different ways to read the parasol miracle. I, I leave you with that one. So. That's all I got, folks. Uh, Katie, do you mind if I just say, make a quick announcement real quick on my... Really quick, because I've never done this. <laughs> I'm always like, thanks, <laughs> bye. <laughs> uh, two, two things, if you don't know, and I'm saying this sort of more for posterity, YouTube world, you all probably know, uh, I do have a SoundCloud page where I post Dharma talks and all of that. It's like a repository for me, MC Owens' teachings. So that's Lotus Underground on SoundCloud, and you can find it in various places. Um, so please take note of that. Um, the second thing I just want to put out there that I've never put out there before, um, a couple of years ago, going on a few years ago, uh, I started taking uh, private students, one-on-one -on -one students, um, and it was sort of uh, a slow process of doing that, you know, feeling my own uh, comfort and uh, cap capableness in that way. Uh, but now it's been a couple years and I kind of have what I would call a practice of that, where I have processes and curriculum and protocols for handling one on one. I basically call myself a Dharma tutor. So if you're into Dharma, I would tutor, I tutor, and I basically design curriculum and classes for you based on what you want to learn about what you want to know uh if, you, if you've been taking classes with me you know my my knowledge is kind of broad in that way where i it's like you oh you want to know about vajrayana let's do it oh you want to do hinayana meditation let's do it um you want to do chinese you want to do sanskrit let's do it so i kind of like a jack of all trades in terms of dharma that way and so, yeah, if you're looking for a tutor, I'm available. You can contact me, um, my email, uh, mcharlesowens at gmail. Uh, just send me an email. Just get it hold of me through Instagram or wherever you see me or know me. Uh, yeah, and I design it and I do either meetings once a week, twice a month, once a month, once a year for hours, for five minutes, you know, it's really crafted to what your needs are. So if you're looking for such a thing, please reach out because uh, I am available in this virtual space these days. So thanks for listening to that message and thanks for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. <laughs>